And Coach Belichick was amazing. I spent three, four hours with him that day um, that I got the job. And he's like, Jed, your focus needs to be the job. Football still has to take priority. Mm -hmm. Education has to still take priority. We can't just decide on where to go to school for what ends up being not life-changing money. And what's forgotten is that, and I explain this to parents all the time, no matter what somebody tells you they're gonna get, all they're actually telling you is this is what your son's going to spend. I think Kenny Pickett's a great example. If Kenny Pickett left Pitt mm -hmm. and went somewhere different and didn't have the success he had, he would have actually lost millions of no dollars. Doubt. Yeah. And that's unfortunately what happens more than not. I want to tell you guys about a new sponsor of the podcast, Athletic Greens. And when I found out Athletic Greens was sponsoring the pod, I was fired up because it's something I actually use. Guys, I've been super picky about who actually sponsors this podcast because I don't want to be promoting things I don't like. And that's why I wanted to do Athletic Greens. I use it every single day. Athletic Greens is super easy to use. It's one scoop and you get tons, 70 plus vitamins, minerals, nutrients, a bunch of other stuff that I know is good for you. I don't even know what it is though. And it's delicious, tastes good, it makes me feeling great. With my busy travel schedule, it's super hard to make sure I'm getting my nutrients, get my vitamins, and Athletic Greens makes it super easy. Now that I'm getting farther away from my playing career, I've been taking my health more and more seriously, been talking to my doctor about it, and Athletic Greens has been a major part of feeling more energized, getting back in better shape, and even improving my digestive system. So whether you're a current athlete, former athlete, or just a regular person trying to optimize your health and optimize performance, I encourage you to invest in your health today with Athletic Greens and AG1 and see the massive difference it can make in your everyday energy. If you want to take ownership of your health, try AG1 today and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel pack with your first purchase by going to drinkag1.com slash next up. That's drinkag1.com slash next up and get a one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs. And guys, please support the sponsors of this podcast like AG1 because your support for them supports me, supports us, and allows us to create this great content. So go to drinkag1.com slash next up and support our podcast and take advantage of your health with Athletic Greens. Before we get back to the pod, let me tell you guys about my favorite way to make money on sports and fire on sports. It's Prize Picks. Prize Picks is sponsoring this pod, and I love it because I actually use it all the time. I've been trying different sports books, different daily fantasy apps, and Prize Picks is by far the best. Prize Picks is different than regular sports books or sports betting because on Prize Picks you're picking players, not teams. So if you know sports, no ball, know what players are going to ball out, you can make tons of money. On Prize Picks, each player has a set projected total for a stat. Let's say points, rebounds. If it's Steph Curry, 30 points, you pick higher or lower for Steph Curry. Super fun, and you can make tons of money. I've been ripping on it, and I have a special promo code for you guys to get a $100 deposit bonus with the code NEXTUP. Use the code NEXTUP when you download prize picks, or click the link in the description. It'll do it automatically for you. Code NEXTUP gets you a $100 deposit bonus, so you can fire on sports on prize picks. Let's rock on prize picks. Before we get back to the pod, I gotta tell you all something real quick. If you haven't heard already, it is Smooth Sacks summer. That's right, this is the summer you keep your balls cool while still looking hot with Manscaped. Manscaped's the leader in below the waist grooming and they all want us to have a ball this summer. Dive head first into smooth sack summer by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with my code Adam B. Quick story for you guys about Manscaped. So last summer, before I was a Manscaped user, I was grooming myself before I went to the beach. And let's just say I had a little accident and nicked my balls the wrong way, I had a little bit of a cut. Now normally I'm a big beach guy and dive right into the ocean. Now, normally I'm a big ocean guy, but this time I went headfirst into the salt water, and let's just say that grooming issue down below came back to haunt me in the worst possible way. That was when I went looking for a solution for my grooming, the family jewels, and I found Manscaped, and I've used it almost every single day. Well, not quite every day every other day since. So trust me, you're hearing it from me, a guy with experience. You need Manscaped to trim your family jewels because it is officially smooth sack summer. Go to manscaped.com, use my code ADAMB for 20% off and free shipping on your next order. And please guys, support the sponsors of this podcast because it helps me, allows us to travel around and have one amazing guest. So support Manscaped for sponsoring this pod. Go to manscaped.com, use the code ADAMB for 20% off and free shipping on your next order. What's up guys? Welcome back to the Next Up Podcast. I'm Adam Brenneman. We're at University of Arizona today in Tucson, Arizona, talking to Arizona head football coach Jed Fish. The dude has seen it all in football, NFL, college football, 
He was with Bill Belichick, with Sean McVay. Now he's leading the Arizona football program. We're going to dive into tons of stuff. His career, NIL, Transfer Portal. He's got some amazing things to say, great stories to tell. Before we go see Coach Fish, please subscribe to this channel. Or if you're listening on audio, subscribe to Spotify or Apple and get the podcast every single week. Your guys' support allows me to travel around the country and have the best guests possible on and show you guys an inside look at college football that no one's shown you before. Let's go talk to Coach Fish. Next up. We redid the whole facility. Yeah. This room was uh this room turned out really good. Yeah, this is cool. Yeah, really good. I got the got the little tour. It, it's uh everything looks good. Are we are we good to go? Yeah, we we'll start start going. Yeah. There's uh man, so much I want to talk to you about, coach. There's just your your whole journey, your whole career. We'll start with um is his mic good? You wanna fix his mic for him? So get him in front of his face. Um this mic here? Yeah, he'll, he'll come. You want me to slide a little bit? I can just slide. Is that good? Yeah. Yeah, okay. there we go. Um, so I was talking to Jake Butt this morning. I called him on the way here, and he, he could not have said enough nice things about you. He, he, he loves you. And he was talking about, he said to ask you about your favorite cover four beater. He said he, the backside F tight end with the X running the fork concept. I think yeah. you guys ran it against Penn State, right? We ran it against yeah. a lot of people. <laughs> uh, yeah, that fork concept was a big concept for us. Still is. Yeah. Still is. We've, uh, that's a Spurrier concept from the 1990s. <laughs> that, that thing's been around for a while. I haven't stopped calling <laughs> since. And he called it fork back in 19... 95, 96, 7, 8, all the way through. So that's what we call it. Yeah. Most people call it scissors. I think that's right. I think Jake just used it as an excuse to send me some of his, some of his uh, highlight clips, you know. No question. <laughs> that sounds about right. Um, so t we're in the closing room, right? That's what you call it. Ex explain kind of what this room is used for. It's, it's connected to your office. Yeah. You know, when I got here, um, we needed a pretty big or significant renovation. Uh, we wanted to change the culture of you're not just here to be here. You're here to win. Yeah. Uh, we're not just here and, you know, competing with um, some programs. We're competing with all programs. So I, um, I researched what it looked like, uh, what every pr head coach's office looked like, what um, different areas in their facilities look like. And you know, this was a conference room at one point in time uh, with just a whiteboard and a TV mm -hmm. and a table and chairs. And I felt like you need to have a place where you could sit down, talk to the parents, talk to the family. And I didn't want to be behind my desk to yeah. do that. Yeah. You know, I just don't think that's a good uh, look. And then on top of it, I felt like it was also good for our own current team. Yeah. Like, come in here and talk to me, you know, come in here and share what's going on in your life. And that's why I put the candy out, too, you know, brings them in here. Yeah, I mean, I've been, I've been having a couple of pieces as we've been waiting here. No, it's, it's a great facility. It was fun to kind of walk around and see it. And, and uh, you know, it's been even the leadership room, which we'll get into, it was, it was really cool to see. The, kind of the place I wanted to start, year three now at Arizona, what's been the biggest change, you think, from year one to now? Uh well, I would say the biggest change is personnel. You know, there's no question about that. We have 96 or 97 players that uh, were not on the roster in 2020 mm -hmm. before we got, the year before we arrived that are now on the roster. So the change is completely, um, it's a totally different team. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also say that there's a different mentality now. Uh, our guys really believe that they belong mm -hmm. and that they can be in conversations with the top teams and um, that they have the opportunity and we have the opportunity to win football games that maybe we didn't think we could early on. And then also in the same token, they're really excited about the chance to, um, to go showcase that. And to, yeah. there's a confidence and a swagger about them that I really credit our strength staff. I think our strength staff has done an incredible job of helping our kids gain confidence. Do you feel, I feel like even, I live on the East Coast, I feel like there is a buzz around this program right now. I tweeted it today. Just some hype, some, like you said, swagger. Do you feel that? Like, do you feel the outside noise of like people being excited about Arizona football? Yeah, I, I think I, I really do. I mean, I, I'm, uh, I'm an East Coast guy initially, you know, and I started there and grew up there and went to school in Florida, so kind of worked my way down there. And uh, what, what's happened is we've been able to generate some excitement with our program because of the players. And the players have done an amazing job of not leaving. 
<laughs> and, helps, uh, right? That's always good. <laughs> you know, that our best players stayed. Yeah. And when your best players stay, now you get some hype because now people are going to want to know how Jordan Morgan recovered from his ACL and can he be a first-round tackle? Yeah. You know, could Jacob Cowan compete for the Blitnikoff? Is mm -hmm. T-Mac, you know, going to be an All-American? And, and is Mike Wiley or Tanner McLaughlin getting drafted? Is Justin Flo going to be what he was cracked out to be in high school? Mm -hmm. And so now all of a sudden there's a nice buzz going, and when you score points, people like to watch you play. Um, and our, our goal is to become a, a program that everyone talks about. When you got here in 2021, your first year, what was the one thing that surprised you the most when you arrived in Tucson? Um, I think what I was surprised the most about is that it was thought of as a one-sport town. Mm -hmm. And I never, under I never understood why. Uh, I've never thought of that in, in my career. Uh, when I was at Michigan, our football team was top five. Our basketball team was in the final four. When I was at Florida, our football team won the national championship. Our basketball team won the national championship. Mm -hmm. um, when I was at UCLA, I mean, you're comp no one thought of UCLA when I was at UCLA as a basketball-only school. So I, I don't understand why that was the case here. And we worked very, very hard to try to change that perception. Um, I think it's still hard, but as I've said, in 1998, they won the national championship in basketball, 97. Um, in 1998, we went 12-1 and one in football here. Yeah. Uh, so they're one game away from winning the national championship in football. Yeah. So what would have changed, right? What would, would history have changed uh, its course? And uh, our goal is to get it back to understanding that we can be a two-sport town and more, yeah. and it's not just about uh, basketball. Uh, I'm super curious to dive into the whole process of how you got the job, what the, what the transition's like, and, and we'll get, get all into that. Before we get there, when you, when you got here and you became first-time head coach here, was there anything on the job the first few days that you felt, you know, you prepare your whole life to be a head coach, right? Was there anything that you almost not forgot to prepare for, but was like, I forgot about that part of it? Well, there was no transfer portal and NIL right. about two weeks before <laughs> I, I interviewed for the job. <laughs> so uh, that was a bit of a curveball. Yeah. Uh, you know, Bill Parcells said, when you become a head coach, you write down a to-do list before you leave at night, and then when you get to work the next morning, you might as well rip that to-do list up <laughs> because there's five new things that you didn't know you had to do. Yeah. Uh, that is what I would say was the biggest surprise, yeah. was how many things come at you in so many different ways that can fall on your plate that you're not expecting. And you could be prepared and plan and have ideas of how you want to run your offense or your defense, what staff you want to hire, how you want to run your strength staff, your culture, your program. But then something can happen at any time. Yeah. And at any moment in time, clearly, no one was expecting in the last 24 months or 30 months now, the amount of changes that have occurred in the NCAA. Mm -hmm. So that alone has caused you to reevaluate and rethink how you recruit, how you coach, how you keep a team together. Mm -hmm. um, but additionally, you're still also dealing with every other issue that comes into coaching 110, 18 to 22 year olds. Mm -hmm. Well, let's dive into the changes you just mentioned and we'll, we'll go into the whole getting the job process in a little bit. You were just in DC talking about NIL. And I, I've heard this line a couple of times and it's true. College football has changed more in probably three years than it has in the last hundred, right? It's, it's a completely different game than it was. How has the portal, NIL, all that stuff changed your strategy, changed everything from scholarship allotment to your staff structure to how you spend your time recruiting? Just take me through how, how it's changed the entire, entire philosophy and strategy that you have to operate within. Well, I, I kind of, when you look back on the, let's call it, when you're running your program in the 2000s or 2010s, um, you're not really thinking about a pro personnel department, a yeah. college personnel department. You're not thinking about how you're going to interact with NIL foundations or collectives. You're not really thinking about um, the roster management aspect of ch the challenge of high school recruiting. Mm -hmm. And then versus transfer portal and then don't forget about the pandemic yeah. then <laughs> added on years of people's clock which yeah. never occurred prior without changing the amount of scholarship limit mm -hmm. so um what what we did was when we got hired here 
Um, I hired a, a few guys right away, guys that I've coached with, Jimmy Doherty, Brendan Carroll, um, were kind of the first two hires that we had. And immediately, those were the guys that I relied upon to try to build this program the way we wanted to. And it then became, we have to build a personnel department like the NFL. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was just coming from the Patriots at that time, the Rams prior. So I had about three years in the NFL before between UCLA and here. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking about, we're really getting closer and closer and closer to the pro model. So could I set up a department like the pro model? Mm -hmm. Could we have a social media group like we did in the NFL to make sure that our public relations was taken care of properly? Could we have a personnel department that we were actually assigning different branches, one branch to be in charge of high school recruiting, yeah. one branch to be in charge of college recruiting? Mm -hmm. Could you have a um, analysts that were assigned to different areas? How much are students going to be involved? How do you get your equipment room the way you want it, the training room the way you want it? So it became, and I would say it's been about two years mm -hmm. of that evolution of getting everybody in the space where you want them. Um, and then, of course, at any given moment, a rule change can occur, right. <laughs> and you're you know, redirecting your thought process. Mm -hmm. So what made you decide that this was the place you wanted to be a head coach? And then what was that process like of, you know, the first phone call, the first conversation where you realized this was a possibility. Yeah, you know, I always laugh. Brian Billick once said, uh, you know, uh, I'm only going to take a job that's the perfect fit for me. And uh, there's only 32 of those. <laughs> and uh, when, it, when he got done coaching at the Ravens. So, you know, you kind of laugh like, I'm only going to take a Division One head coaching Power 5 job, and there's 69 of those uh, right now. So, I, you know, I wanted to be a college head coach. Uh, that's where my mindset was at that moment in time. I love college football. I went back and forth, as you know, when I recruited you, when uh, I was coaching at the University of Miami, yeah. and you were coming out as a top-ranked tight end in the country. Um, I, I always too, loved right? it. Was, yeah, uh, yeah, and Coach Carroll saw, yeah. <laughs> was yeah. our tight ends yeah. coach. Yeah. So, um, you know, I always loved college. Mm -hmm. I loved my time at University of Florida. I credit, um, really, a lot of my career to Coach Spurrier mm -hmm. and the the idea of college athletics is just incredible to me. Uh, so fast forward, I had a couple college opportunities to be coordinators in different places from Minnesota to Michigan to UCLA to Miami. Um, never been really a position coach in college, so it's kind of been a rare, um, a rare challenge other than coaching the quarterbacks. And then um, I was coaching the NFL, very comfortable, very happy, loving every moment of it, working for the greatest coach of all time. Yeah. And I get a call. Uh, from the president and the athletic director here at Arizona. And I interviewed here when I was coaching at UCLA. Uh, when I was, I was the interim head coach at UCLA in 2017, I interviewed for the head job here mm -hmm. at that point. Um, they chose Coach Sumlin, and then they came back and they brought, they, they called me back and they said, would you like to come here in 2021? And um, you start listening to the program and you start listening to their vision mm -hmm. and you start thinking like, wait a second here why couldn't you win a championship in Arizona? And why couldn't you take a job where the expectations were currently low mm -hmm. and go in the sunshine, go yeah. to the desert, have the West Coast, mm -hmm. have opportunities to bring quarterbacks and receivers in, mm -hmm. have an opportunity to really build it from the ground up to where I wanted it, be able to use basketball as a recruiting tool, baseball as a recruiting tool, softball as a recruiting tool, incredible fraternities and sororities, mm -hmm incredible college campus, great academics. And I really felt like if 25 years ago someone said, do you want to be the Florida head coach? I, of course, would have said yes. And I feel like it's the same thing here. Yeah. I feel like being the Arizona head coach is like being at Florida when I was there 25 years ago. Then when you took the job, what's the whirlwind like for the 48 hours after when you're trying to, trying to put your staff together, trying to retain your own roster, <laughs> trying to... They yeah. should have gone to the portal. <laughs> no, I can imagine, right? You can imagine what it was like because we were still, we'll call it on a slow crawl out of the pandemic yeah. at that point. Yeah. So you still weren't out recruiting. Yeah. Um, interviewing coaches, you had to do them on Zoom. Zoom yeah. 
uh, we were still playing. It was week 15 of the football season in the NFL mm -hmm. when I was hired. So we were actually, I interviewed on a Monday night that we were playing the Dolf the Dolphins, I think that, or maybe the Bills, that following Sunday. No, the Dolphins, that following Sunday. You're doing an interview, then you're getting a job. I got a job. I got the job Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. Now you're sitting there and you're saying, okay, well, how do I do this? <laughs> and Coach Belichick was amazing. I spent three, four hours with him that day um, that I got the job. And he's like, Jed, your focus needs to be the job. Mm -hmm. You need to go. Um, I appreciate you wanting to finish tip sheets, and I appreciate you know you wanting to watch the last bit of film here, mm -hmm. but go be the head coach at Arizona. Yeah. You know, be the head coach at Arizona. But I did the press conference in the New England building because really? I, we couldn't <laughs> get here and the Zoom, and so we wound up doing the introductory press conference over Zoom <laughs> from the Patriots conference room, uh, which. Hopefully, no one else ever has to do that yeah. uh, going forward. But um, we did that, and then it's a total whirlwind. Arrived mm -hmm. on campus. Prior to that, had breakfast with Teddy Bruschi because mm -hmm. he lived about 20 minutes from yeah. me. We sat down. We talked about U of A. Got on the phone with Gronk. Talked to him. And then um, got to work and walked in here. Turned the lights on, and I was like, now what? <laughs> you know, now we got to find players, coaches. Yeah. Equipment, everything, and um, and go try to win. Yeah. And that was uh, it. Was a crazy six months. I want to tell you guys about a new sponsor of the podcast, Athletic Greens. And when I found out Athletic Greens was sponsoring the pod, I was fired up because it's something I actually use. Guys, I've been super picky about who actually sponsors this podcast because I don't want to be promoting things I don't like. And that's why I wanted to do Athletic Greens. I use it every single day. Athletic Greens is super easy to use. It's one scoop and you get tons, 70 plus vitamins, minerals, nutrients, a bunch of other stuff that I know is good for you. I don't even know what it is though. And it's delicious, tastes good, it makes me feeling great. With my busy travel schedule, it's super hard to make sure I'm getting my nutrients, get my vitamins, and Athletic Greens makes it super easy. Now that I'm getting farther away from my playing career, I've been taking my health more and more seriously, been talking to my doctor about it, and Athletic Greens has been a major part of feeling more energized, getting back in better shape, and even improving my digestive system. So whether you're a current athlete, former athlete, or just a regular person trying to optimize your health and optimize performance, I encourage you to invest in your health today with Athletic Greens and AG1 and see the massive difference it can make in your everyday energy. If you want to take ownership of your health, try AG1 today and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel pack with your first purchase by going to drinkag1.com slash next up. That's drinkag1.com slash next up and get a one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs. And guys, please support the sponsors of this podcast like AG1 because your support for them supports me, supports us, and allows us to create this great content. So go to drinkag1.com slash next up and support our podcast and take advantage of your health with Athletic Greens. Before we get back to the pod, let me tell you guys about my favorite way to make money on sports and fire on sports. It's Prize Picks. Prize Picks is sponsoring this pod, and I love it because I actually use it all the time. I've been trying different sports books, different daily fantasy apps, and Prize Picks is by far the best. Prize Picks is different than regular sports books or sports betting because on Prize Picks you're picking players, not teams. So if you know sports, know ball, know what players are going to ball out, you can make tons of money. On Prize Picks, each player has a set projected total for a stat. Let's say points, rebounds. If it's Steph Curry, 30 points, you pick higher or lower for Steph Curry. Super fun, and you can make tons of money. I've been ripping on it, and I have a special promo code for you guys to get a $100 deposit bonus with the code NEXTUP. Use the code NEXTUP when you download prize picks, or click the link in the description, and it'll do it automatically for you. Code NEXTUP gets you a $100 deposit bonus so you can fire on sports on prize picks. Let's rock on prize picks. Now back to the pot. When you walked in, into the office day one, what did you have in your mind, like, we need to change this as soon as possible? Well, mentality mm -hmm. was probably the first thing that we needed to change. Uh, we came off, uh, we got hired, and Amber, my wife, and our, my girls, we all flew in and walked into the office the very first day, met, um, nobody was around, it was over the winter break. Mm -hmm. And you know you, you, you hear about 70 to seven, mm -hmm. right? That's what you hear yeah. in the interview. And you hear about uh, with the, in the first press conference, you know, you're not an Arizona guy, <laughs> right? So how are you gonna know? And where'd you come from? And you know, you're considered what a, like a, a vagabond assistant coach, right? <laughs> you're just been assistant coach at a lot of different programs. 
So what is going to qualify you to turn our program around? Mm -hmm. So I thought two things had to change. Number one, we had to fully invest ourselves in the community. And we needed to become an Arizona person, an Arizona family. Mm -hmm. That our community in Tucson felt like this guy's invested in us, not looking for the next job. Yeah. And then the second thing that had to change is our team had to believe that we're not defined by past scores. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be defined by how we take this program moving forward. And those, are, uh, those were two huge challenges. The really interesting thing when I think about Arizona is the, the challenges and the strengths that come with where, the, where you're located, right? You have an amazing recruiting base with some of the best skill position players in the country out here. You got some, I mean, Arizona's become like a quarterback capital. You got yeah. tons of big time recruits, but you're also competing with everyone coming here to recruit because a lot of the transient families. What's the recruiting strategy on one, keeping kids home in Arizona, and also having to compete with Michigan and Penn State and USC, all these schools come here to recruit now? Yeah, well, I think it's twofold, right? The first thing is assistant coaches like to go on vacation in Arizona. <laughs> so everybody wants to recruit Arizona, yeah, yeah. right? I mean, if you're from the Northeast or the Midwest yeah. and you're out in winter recruiting, where else do you want to go for a few <laughs> days, right? So now everybody knows our secrets. Yeah. They all know that we got some really good players in the state. Yeah. Uh, the second thing is, you know, you, you get into that discussion of do you build a border? Do you build a guardrails around your state and try mm -hmm. to keep people away from it and you know make a huge sales pitch about staying home um i think what it comes down to is that what makes tucson special is that we're a col we're in a college town mm -hmm. uh in a pro state yeah and we're in a college town in a state as you mentioned that everybody wants to be a part of yeah so it's very transient people are leaving california to move here people are leaving other cities to move here but in the world of nil mm -hmm. In the world of being able to market yourself as a student athlete when you couldn't do it before, you really should want to avoid pro towns. Yeah. Um, you're not going to be able to put your face up there against Devin Booker's face mm -hmm. in a, uh, a car sales ad, yeah. right? They're going to pay Devin. Yeah. They're going to pay Kyler Murray. Yeah. They're going to, and you go through the whole process of wherever you're at, if you're in a place, you know, LA's got a lot of people to put on billboards, <laughs> yeah. right? Prior to, you know, a corner yeah. from uh, a university. Yeah. But in Tucson, we are the pro team. Yeah. And we are the team that um, everybody knows. And you're the football team, you're the basketball team, you're the softball team of U of A. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big deal. Yeah. And so what I felt as if when we're trying to keep people in state, especially the high quality players, they have to understand what is the value mm -hmm. you know, of your name, image, and likeness. Mm -hmm. And what is the value if you could actually be successful in a college town in your home state. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, I think that's has brought a lot of success for us. When you're recruiting high school and transfer portal players, and I'm assuming it's different, how much is NIL actually asked about and talked about? Because from the media's perspective, that's all anyone talks about, yeah. right? That's, tw that's the only conversation. I'm assuming transfers ask more is, is, would be my question, but how, you know, how prevalent is it really? Yeah, you know, Adam, I, I think if you think back to your time when you made your decision, yeah. um, football still has to take priority. Mm -hmm. Education has to still take priority. We can't just decide on where to go to school for what ends up being not life-changing money, yeah. right? There's this perception that there's a dollar value thrown out there, and how could you possibly turn it down? <laughs> and what's forgotten is that, and I explain this to parents all the time, no matter what somebody tells you they're gonna get, mm -hmm. all they're actually telling you is this is what your son's going to spend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're not telling you anything else. They're not yeah. saying this is his IRA fund. Mm -hmm. They're not saying this is what he's gonna do for his kid's college fund. They're just looking you in the eye and saying, this is how much spending money we're gonna give your son. Do you want him to come here or not? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think you should make a decision on college based on spending money. And I definitely don't believe you should make a decision on being a college football player 
um, without thinking about all the things that go into fulfilling your dream. Yeah. It is a topic. It's not the only topic. <laughs> Um, I think transfers more than anyone. It depends. Mm -hmm. Are you a? Are you leaving an undergraduate school to go to? A, a, you know, are you an undergrad transfer or graduate transfer? Mm -hmm. Graduate transfers are making business decisions based upon their ability to play pro football or not. Mm -hmm. They want a chance to play pro football. They're not going to get wrapped up in six months of NIL. Mm -hmm. Undergraduate transfers that are good players, as I call in DC, I call them the elite transfer portal. Mm -hmm. If you're a part of the elite transfer portal, you're getting in there for money. Mm -hmm. If you're part of the transfer portal, and you're just like everybody else, just trying to find a different home. Yeah, it seems like the the issue with NIL comes with the combination of the transfer portal and what you just mentioned for elite transfer portal guys, their value is much higher when they enter the portal than it is. I talked to Kenny Pickett and I had him yeah. on the podcast. He talked about how last, his last year at Pitt, he made a hundred grand. If he would have entered the portal, he would have made millions, yep. but he stayed at Pitt, so he didn't. What's the solution for NIL? And since you just came from DC, I'm assuming, you, I mean, there's a ton of solutions for a lot of things in DC, right? <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> that's where problems get solved. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. There's a lot of um, individuals have solutions <laughs> yeah. on what they think we should do. I think Kenny Pickett's a great example. Um, if Kenny Pickett left Pitt mm -hmm. and went somewhere different and didn't have the success he had, he would have actually lost millions of no dollars. Yeah. And that's unfortunately what happens more than not. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of going somewhere different for dollars, I believe, is a major problem, but it happens anyway. When we were in D.C., and it was a fantastic event, our president came up with the idea mm -hmm. about four months ago to host a summit three months ago, to host a summit in Washington, D.C. at the University of Arizona's um, building that we have in, on Pennsylvania Avenue, mm -hmm. at three blocks from the White House. And uh, he started inviting people, and we wound up having athletic directors from all the conferences, uh, the ACC commissioner, the SEC commissioner, uh, economists, lawyers, you name it, the president of the NCAA. Oh, wow. So we, were, we solved all the problems. I can't tell you all the solutions yet, but it's solved. Uh, no. So what you learn there is that we got big problems. Yeah. And we don't all have the solution to how we're going to handle the situation. Because the situation has so many layers, mm -hmm. right? Is it going to be about transparency? Mm -hmm. And is if all of us register what all of our players make, okay, uh, into a big pool, does that then mean that it's actually a bigger recruiting inducement to go to that school? <laughs> yeah. Because now what you're saying is if you go to my school, mm -hmm. you'll get X. If you go to this school, you'll get yeah. Y. Is that really what we want? Because that feels like it goes against the idea of don't use yeah. NIL for recruiting inducement. Uh, I think that when we talk about agents, that was a big part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. How do we handle that? How do we handle now you're a marketing agent, but you're not a football agent? Yeah. <laughs> or are you actually the one brokering transfer deals? Because you can get 3% to 10%, depending on your deal, yeah. for a kid that doesn't even know what he's doing, doesn't even know why he's doing it. Yeah. You know, and I've said that to parents. If you think about it, if you leave school, if you leave one place where you're getting 25,000 and you go somewhere to get 100,000, and your agent that got that done for you, and he took 10% of that, so that's 10,000 that went to him. Mm -hmm. Then you pay taxes on the other, whatever, 90. So now let's say you left with 55, divided by 12, your son's gonna spend $4,500 every single month on shoes, chains, clothes, <laughs> cars, food, housing, whatever it might be, and then end up being in a situation where he's lost the value of money, he lost yeah. the value of adversity, he doesn't understand what it's like to compete, and maybe he's taken uh, a bad spot. Yeah. And that's what we talked about in D.C. Um, and it was really unique. You know, I learned a lot. You know that Clemson has only taken two players in the transfer portal. Really? Amazing stat. Yeah. Did not know that. Uh, where other programs we know have almost filled the roster with them. Yeah, completely flipped them. <laughs> Are you having that conversation with your own players a lot? When they come in probably this room right here and talk to you about, yeah. about hey, my agent told me this school will pay me this. And is that, is that I, I feel like you've used that that explanation before because you, you, you say it well yeah 
Well, I've used it a lot on our players. Yeah. I've used it on rec- with recruiting. I've used it uh, with the ACC, SEC, <laughs> Pac-12 commissioner. Yeah. I've used it with the president of the NCAA the mm-hmm. other day. I said we're missing the boat yeah. on what we've tried, what we tried to accomplish. And I don't know Jim Tressel. Okay, I don't know Jim Tressel. But I do know this. I know he was one heck of a football coach and one incredible human being, from what I understand. And if there was NIL back then, right, Terrell Pryor's tattoo that he got for free would have meant absolutely nothing. Yeah. And we probably would have seen Jim Tressel win a bunch more national championships. Yeah. So what I believe that they thought they were doing right mm-hmm. by making – an opportunity for you to benefit from your name, image, and likeness, we've turned it into something that it's not meant to be. Yeah. And now it's trying to put toothpaste back in the bottle, which is almost impossible. With all the other changes in college football, realignment, the media deals, everything changing, what, what do you think college football looks like in five, ten years? Do we have, is, is there revenue share for the players on media deals? Is it... Is there, are there two major conferences? Is it a breakaway from the NCAA? What, what, what do you think it looks like? i tell you what I'd like it to look like. Uh, what I think it would look like, I don't know. Yeah. I really have no, because there's so much unknown and so little known. It's not going to look like it does today. We mm-hmm. know that for a fact. Um, I think there's opportunity out there. Um, I think uh, right now, currently, we have a non-sustainable model. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're unable to support all the other sports with what we're doing for um, and in, within the NCAA. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an impossible. It's an impossible model currently to just rely upon football to pay for all of the sports mm-hmm. and then yet change all the rules. Yeah. So we have to go back to some. We'll have to have some set of rules or some revenue share that goes on. Um, I'm worried about all the other sports being able to be successful. Uh, I think that what would be nice, if it would be at all possible, is maybe have the 32 NFL teams each buy two college teams, <laughs> and there's your 64 teams, and split the conference up in half, and let them pay a salary cap, let the kids get X amount of dollars you know, through a revenue share of some nature, and then let us keep them as student athletes, and let, let us teach them how to be great students, great players, do the best we can, but not sit there and spend half of our time trying to figure out if we can keep a guy or lose a guy for thousands of dollars. Um, I would think that would be a phenomenal way. I think it would be great for us to find a way to recognize that um, there's value in teaching time management. There's value in teaching these kids all the, uh, the aspects of being a college student. Mm-hmm. And we have a ton of unintended consequences that we're all fighting right now. We have gambling that's a huge part Another big one. Yeah. of what we're trying to deal with. And we wonder why gambling is becoming more prevalent. And the answer is very simple, because they have more money. <laughs> so now when players get more money, what else are they going to do with it, yeah. right? We have um, all aspects of trying to figure out their decision-making and what they're doing at night, how they're going to handle, you know, why aren't they all attending meals every day? Meals are supposed to be mandatory. Well, they have money now. <laughs> so they don't have to worry about the free meal in the cafeteria, yeah. right? We start worrying about them going to personal trainers more. Mm-hmm. We start worrying about lawsuits that, are, that they're receiving in civil lawsuits. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of aspects of the changes in college football that in five years from now, if we don't get our grip around, our hands around, uh, they'll either be a G League yeah. like basketball, mm-hmm. and then there'll be amateur football, true college football, mm-hmm. or we'll have some parameters and be able to keep this great sport the great sport. I think you just solved it right there. <laughs> the, the, the NFL teams. That's, that's the model. A great, that's a great solution. Yeah. <laughs> Parody. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. Where, uh, shifting gears a little bit, where did It's Personal come from? Before we get back to the pod, I got to tell you all something real quick. If you haven't heard already, it is smooth sack summer. That's right. This is the summer you keep your balls cool while still looking hot with Manscaped. Manscaped's the leader in below-the-waist grooming, and they all want us to have a ball this summer. Dive headfirst into smooth sack summer by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with my code Adam B. Quick story for you guys about Manscaped. So last summer, before I was a Manscaped user, I was grooming myself before I went to the beach. And let's just say I had a little accident and nicked my balls the wrong way. I had a little bit of a cut. Now, normally I'm a big beach guy and dive right into the ocean. 
Now, normally I'm a big ocean guy, but this time I went headfirst into the salt water, and let's just say that grooming issue down below came back to haunt me in the worst possible way. That was when I went looking for a solution for my grooming, the family jewels, and I found Manscaped, and I've used it almost every single day. Well, not quite every day every other day since. So trust me, you're hearing it from me, a guy with experience, you need Manscaped to trim your family jewels because it is officially smooth sack summer. Go to manscaped.com, use my code ADAMB for 20% off and free shipping on your next order. And please guys, support the sponsors of this podcast because it helps me, allows us to travel around and have one amazing guest. So support Manscaped for sponsoring this pod. Go to manscaped.com, use the code ADAMB for 20% off and free shipping on your next order. Before we get back to the pod, let me tell you guys about my favorite way to make money on sports and fire on sports, it's Prize Picks. Prize Picks is sponsoring this pod, and I love it because I actually use it all the time. I've been trying different sports books, different daily fantasy apps, and Prize Picks is by far the best. Prize Picks is different than regular sports books or sports betting because on Prize Picks you're picking players, not teams. So if you know sports, no ball, know what players are going to ball out, you can make tons of money. On Prize Picks, each player has a set projected total for a stat. Let's say points, rebounds. If it's Steph Curry, 30 points, you pick higher or lower for Steph Curry. Super fun and you can make tons of money. I've been ripping on it and I have a special promo code for you guys to get a $100 deposit bonus with the code NEXTUP. Use the code NEXTUP when you download Prize Picks or click the link in the description and it'll do it automatically for you. Code NEXTUP gets you a $100 deposit bonus so you can fire on sports on Prize Picks. Let's rock on Prize Picks. Now back to the pot. Well, I got the job and I was writing um, some notes for the introductory press conference. Mm-hmm. And um, I consulted with a friend of mine who's really, uh, really good at this and is a, a leader and a, really a game changer when it comes to being very influential in terms of uh, working with CEOs and companies. And, you know, he said, well, start explaining to me uh, what's important, you know, to you. What do you want to cover? And I said, you know, the most important thing for me is the personal relationships that you get to make with players. And the idea of in a college, you can recruit a kid from high school, um, you can coach a kid in college, you could attend their wedding, you could watch them be mm-hmm. successful in life. You know, the most important thing to me is that um, we make every person better. Uh, I said the most important thing to me is that I got an opportunity, you know, mm-hmm. and I've been passed over and, you know, I take that personally. So as I was talking, he, he kind of looked at me and goes, sounds like it's personal. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, yeah, it's personal. And he said, well, make that, why don't we make that the theme and then go from there? Yeah. And that's kind of how it happened. And then as you start talking to families mm-hmm. and you start talking to them about, hey, we're going to invest in your son. We're going to invest in the person. Mm-hmm. We're going to understand the person. We're going to take this personally, making him the best he can be. Um, and then you could also look at what's Arizona football been based upon. Right, it's been based upon a lot of three-star players yeah. that have done it the hard way. Yeah. Right, Developing. and if you ask Teddy yeah. Bruschi, right, he took it personally every day. Yeah. That you know, the only offer he had was us in Washington State, I believe. Yeah. Right. So I think what we looked, what we started looking at is, hey man, like let's have a little chip on your shoulder, and rather yeah. than call it like the chip, we decided to go with it's personal. <laughs> yeah, I love it, and it's all over the walls in the in the program. But I was wondering if you had that. From, you know, you've probably been preparing to be a head coach for 10 years, maybe longer, if you had that the whole time or if you just came up with it when you got here. It's cool to hear the, the origin of it. It's pretty yeah. sweet. It's pretty sweet. Yeah, and, and I, I love all the, are all the other things you have hanging on the walls, the, you have, I don't know, the, core, the 12 core values yep. or whatever you call Standards, them. yeah. Standards, um, all the different quotes. Were, were you compiling those throughout your career? Did you kind of, you know, was it during the press conference you came up with them? What, uh, yeah, like you know, I, I think there are certain things that you compile throughout your career, right? Like the values of our program of respect and accountability. Um, that's something that, you know, you learn, you, you really try to figure out. Um, I think that challenge is when I've been on 12 teams, mm-hmm. okay, and I've coached for fantastic coaches uh, that have been incredible mentors for me. And it's trying to understand all of their messaging and then make it my own yeah. and not replicate, you know, Pete Carroll's three rules or mm-hmm. Bill Belichick's values or Mike Krzyzewski's standards, you know, cause I like to read a lot or, mm-hmm. you know, what Brian Billick feels like being a pro means. Yeah. But on the same token, it is also about recognizing I've been with some great coaches Mm -hmm. and when Sean McVay talks about being an all-world communicator 
and the importance of communication, we didn't want to let that go without yeah. trying to say, how are we going to put that in our value program, our value system? When he talked about, um, you know, what the principles of our program and be situational masters and fundamentally sound, and those are things that I believe in. Yeah. And I, I felt as if we didn't want to have slogan soup. We didn't want to have stuff everywhere that meant a lot of different things. Yeah. So how are we going to figure out, you know, what's our standards? What's our values? Cause to, mm -hmm. Because I was going to say to me, but that's really not true. <laughs> to Mike Krzyzewski, um, yeah. in his book, The Gold Standard, he said values plus standards equals culture. Mm -hmm. So it was like, all right, what are our values? We know our values, respect, accountability, integrity, selflessness, enthusiasm. And then what are our standards going to be? And the standards are going to change every year. Mm -hmm. So the standards, uh, that's this year's standards. Um, the standards are created by the leadership. We, come to, we go to my house in January or February, mm -hmm. and we sit around the room. We have a barbecue. We have some dinner. We walk into my uh, family room, and I say, what do you want the team to be about? <laughs> what do you want the team to be about? And um, this year, the first one they said, we want it to be about we, us, and our, not me, my, and mine. Okay? Wow. Well, that's standard number one. Mm -hmm. You know, they said, uh, one of the things they said is we want to tell each other the truth. No lying. Mm -hmm. You know, we felt like there was a little bit too much lying, a little too much deceit. Right? So, you know, one of our standards was look, in the eye, look each other in the eye and tell each other the truth. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how our standards got developed. And we hung them up in the locker room so our guys could see. You know, when you walk in, you chose these mm -hmm. 12 standards. Yeah. You decided what you wanted our culture to be. And then one of the big mantras that since I've been here about becoming a pro, you saw that in a bunch of different mm -hmm. places, be a pro. Uh, and that to me was really what I wanted our program to be about, that very few of our players are going to be NFL players, mm -hmm. right? But that doesn't mean that our players can't be professionals in yeah. life. Yeah. And we have to help them understand that you become a pro in life if you learn etiquette. You become a pro in life if you learn respect. You become a pro in life if you're a good student. Mm -hmm. And uh, the greatest compliment a football player can get is that kid's a pro. Yeah. But I believe that about all kids. True. The other really cool thing you've done that's a little different is all the speakers you've had come in here. You have a wall in the facility with all. I was when I first walked by it, I was trying to connect what the wall was when I before I read the thing because it's all different people, people you've coached with, business leaders. Um, and I was like, are they all Arizona alums? Yeah, <laughs> going to be. It. But you've you've made it a a, fo a a point of intention and focus to have great speakers come in, talk to the team. Uh, and some of your staff was even telling me you do, maybe it's once a week where you kind of teach them a lesson on, uh, on different things. So talk to me about that a little bit and where that came from. And, and a lot of them are from your past relationships throughout the NFL and, and th things like that. I wish they were all Arizona alum. Our yeah. NIL collective I was looking would, at it, I was like. Our NIL collective would be, <laughs> It'd be great. through the roof. Yeah. Uh, no, what we did, we started a program called We Educate Wednesday. And um, I started it our very first spring, very, very first spring, because as you remember, or winter really, I guess February of 2021, um, there was so much going on in the world, yeah. right? And everything from should you get vaccinated or should you not, mm -hmm. to um, there was an enormous uh, social push of Black Lives Matter. Yeah. There was uh, social injustice going on across the country. There was um, a brand new culture being built at University of Arizona. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, all right, we've got to use this opportunity. And I want to use this platform as the head coach to start teaching our kids and let them hear from different people that are leaders in the, in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't, you know, I started with, I think the very first speaker might have been Matthew Slater. Um, and Matt yeah. Slater was a pa New England Patriot, yeah, special teams, special teams, teams right? yeah. absolute demon. But more than that, he was truly one of, um, you know, the biggest advocates for social justice. Mm -hmm. uh, he's an 18-year NFL vet or 17-year NFL vet, extremely bright, and was able to share with our guys, you know, about the locker room mm -hmm. and about the importance of the locker room. And didn't talk about X's and O's and didn't talk about anything like that. And then we were able to kind of progress into there was a lot of discussion about the vaccination. Mm -hmm. So I understand that there's a lot of people that question 
you know, do you tell them this to, for your own cause or not, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there. <laughs> And there's a lot of people that believe that you're doing something for, to help yourself. So I just got two independent physicians. One of them being Myron Roll, who played in the NFL, who's a Harvard graduate, Oxford graduate, mm -hmm. and played at Florida State and played drafted player and ran the Harvard uh, COVID response mm -hmm. and had him talk to our guys about the importance of the vaccination. And uh, Justin Treve actually ran it for Michigan. Mm -hmm. And I felt like if you get those guys, they know that they're not in it for Arizona. <laughs> yeah. They're in it for their health. Mm -hmm. And then what started becoming like a trend is our guys would be like, hey, coach, what about this or what about that? And we wound up having the Surgeon General of the United States speak to us. We had Barry wow. Sheck, who was O.J. Simpson's defense lawyer, <laughs> who ran the Innocence Project to explain to our kids um, what, what goes on out there. As we were all, you know, there has been so many concerns yeah. about you know, racism in the legal system. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to bring people in to talk about Title IX. Wow. And not Title IX as in men's and women's sports, but Title IX as in what goes on, um, what you can and cannot do and um, on campuses, mm -hmm. you know, uh, men and women. And we thought it was extremely important to not only have the Title IX officer of our university come, but also a law professor that was an advocate for student rights mm -hmm. to be able to hear both sides of every story. Uh, so we kind of went into that approach, and then we got surprised by Pete Carroll or Steve Kerr or <laughs> some other ones that guys would get all excited about in addition to um, learning from many other people out there. So we're up to about 40-something speakers, and wow. uh, the speaker series has been really successful for us. And uh, something I learned today was that Howie Roseman was your, your college roommate, right? Yeah. And he was, he was part of the speaker series. When you were college roommates, did you know that he was going to become one, no. of the, one of the great GMs in the NFL? No, <laughs> no, no, no. You would have never uh, believed it? Would never, no, I would believe it. I would have believed it for sure. I don't think either of us thought we'd be fortunate enough to get the opportunities we got. Yeah. But I think both of us believed that we were confident enough to be successful <laughs> you figure it if out. we got the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. uh, he and I were, I was a freshman, he was a sophomore, we lived in an apartment together. Uh, I lived in the apartment next door to him when he was a junior and I was, his, I mean we were, we lived within three doors or in the same door for yeah. four years um, of college. And he, uh, still one of my closest friends, I was just out there last week. And he is a guy that clearly has done an exceptional job Mm -hmm. uh, with the Eagles and never left the Eagles and talk about going from ground zero up. But I always knew it. I mean, Howie, during the draft, he was as prepared as any NFL GM. <laughs> I mean, he would show up with clipboards and papers and uh, we'd be in, you know, 19 years old in college, 20 years in college, and he, 20 years old, and he was ready to draft every player for the New York <laughs> Jets, by the way. That's what that his, was his team, team was. Yeah. And never really very happy with their drafts. And um, he became... Obviously, he is probably one of the best executives in the NFL. But with that being said, he also has shared a ton with my players. Mm -hmm. uh, he's spoken to my players every year. He has uh, spoken to some of them individually as a favor mm -hmm. to me. He has uh, shared numerous times over text or over uh, FaceTime some things that he believe are important for our program to hear. So mm -hmm. he's been a great ally. That's so cool. That just happened people like that all over the uh, all over the. Uh, you know, to, to be an asset to your team. What, uh, throughout your coaching career, your journey of the different stops you've had, NFL and college, take me through some of the ones that were the most impactful for you and some of the coaches you were around. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it'd be uh, impossible not to start with where I started. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I went to the University of Florida for one reason and one reason only, and that was um, I wanted to coach football, and I wanted to learn football through Steve Spurrier's yeah. eyes. Uh, it was not as easy as I would have thought to get involved. Nowadays, you know, these staffs have, what, 45, 50 people mm -hmm. working in your building. You have students everywhere. Back then, um, we didn't. You yeah. know, it was 1994, just graduated high school, went to UF, and there was one GA on offense, one <laughs> GA on defense, no student assistance. Spent a couple years trying to get in the building, finally got in the building, finally worked my way up, finally became a little something over there. And um, what an amazing, remarkable experience to 
You know, Coach Spurrier won more SEC championships in 12 years than he lost home games. That's wild. Uh, so from 1990 to 2001, he won seven SEC championships and lost six home games, mm -hmm. which is one of the most wild stats of all time. That's insane. So to be around that and to see that and to see how he did it um, and to see how he coached the team and – was just something that will, will stick with me forever. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you just fast forward. Uh, I've had so many amazing opportunities with so many great coaches. Uh, it's hard not to, to talk about my time with uh, Coach Shanahan. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the current landscape of the National Football League, I got to think 16 of the 32 head coaches have been touched by Mike Shanahan in yeah. one way or the other. Um, it's something that uh, I really pride myself on that I had a chance to work for Mike and then work for Sean, mm -hmm. uh, both guys that are Shanahan. You know, Mike mm -hmm. is obviously Mike, and then Sean being a huge Shanahan yeah. disciple. Uh, I think that to work for Pete Carroll and what Pete really brought to the game is be you, man. Mm -hmm. Don't be somebody else. Yeah. If you try to go take a job and not be you, you are not going to be successful. Mm -hmm. Now you don't have to be Pete. Yeah. Or you don't have to be Coach McVay or Coach Spurrier, but you need to be you. Mm -hmm. And what I am so appreciative of, his mentorship, is continuing to remind me of that. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll get some random emails or text messages from him, and I'll get a call and cool. kind of a reminder, yeah. you know, of being you. And then, you know, going through the journey and being around some great coaches and different places and um, finishing up my career, the last two stops with – Sean at LA and going to a Super Bowl. Um, you know, I was in the NFL 13 years, never went to a Super Bowl, got there mm -hmm. in 2018, lost to the Patriots. And uh, I'll tell you a funny story. So we lose to the Patriots. That's not the funny story. Um, <laughs> you know, we were really, really, really good, really good on offense. We wound up losing 13 to 3. It was a devastating loss. Come back the next year. We wind up going nine and seven. And um, we wind up, Coach Belichick calls me up. We're on vacation the day after the season's over and offers me an opportunity to go work for him as a quarterback coach. And it just felt like, how do you say no to that, right? Yeah. Um, so I tell my kids, I, my kids were eight and 10 at the time, mm -hmm. and, or eight and 11. I call them in, I'm like, you know, they love California. <laughs> so I buy all these cookies with Patriots things on them. And I'm like, what do you girls think? <laughs> New England, huh? What do you got? And my youngest said, finally, we'll win a Super Bowl. <laughs> so we get to New England, and the Rams win a Super Bowl. So that did not work. So hats off to Sean. Uh, but he got rid of me, and he won the Super Bowl. But uh, it was one of the classic lines of my eight-year-old. That's amazing. And uh, we wound up going up to New England, had a wonderful time there, learned so much from Coach Belichick. He's by far my biggest mentor, um, call him constantly, ask him a million questions. He is uh, so good at helping younger coaches. He's gone through every issue mm -hmm. that we could ever go through. He's been a head coach since, I think, 1994. And when you think about that, like there's not much that he hasn't seen. There's not much that he hasn't had to deal with. Yeah. And to be able to have the opportunity to ask him for help mm -hmm. um, has just been uh, it's a it's a gift. With regards to both those guys, but we'll start with Sean McVay. What was it about? You know, he was so young uh, and became. I think he was the youngest coach in the NFL, or youngest there's been, and the, there there has been in the NFL. What was it about him that was able to command the respect? That was able to manage the organization. What what did you learn and, and take from him? He's still the youngest coach in yeah. the NFL. He's he still, been there six yeah. years. Uh, <laughs> going into his seventh year, he's still the youngest coach <laughs> in the NFL. <laughs> It's one of the greatest stats. That's one of the greatest <laughs> unknown stats. Uh, he got hired at 30. Yeah. Got crazy. hired at 30 and took over a team um, that was, I believe, 4 and 12 or 3 and 13, maybe 4 and 12, and went to the playoffs in his first year. Uh, went 11 and 5 mm -hmm. on the division. Um, then the next year, you know, I got there. Then we, we started off like 12 and 0, 11 and 0. Uh, went to this, went 13 and three. Went to the Super Bowl that year. Next year, you know, we had a bunch of stuff that happened to the team. Went nine and seven. Next year, went back to the playoffs and the Super Bowl. Um, the guy's a phenomenal football coach. Phenomenal. Um, but he's a 
everyone likes to say it, but he's a better person. He <laughs> is a better person. He yeah. is so genuine mm -hmm. and cares so much about people that that's the difference between um, just being a brilliant football mind where some people would say, oh, this 30-year-old, he's brilliant, or 35-year-old, yeah. he's brilliant. But where Sean separated himself and allowed himself to become a great head coach at 30 is he has humility. Mm -hmm. He didn't come across like he knew everything. Which is hard when you're that young, right? <laughs> but on the same token, he was so caring for his players. Mm -hmm. um, they knew it. And he was vulnerable, and he showed vulnerability, and he was able to um, always have, you know, it's always, his saying is open, honest, and ongoing communication. Mm -hmm. And I think that ongoing part is what separates him. Yeah, that's so true. Is Bill Belichick as tough on his coaches as I would expect them to be? <laughs> well, I mean, Bill Belichick is the GOAT. <laughs> so when you're the GOAT, uh, you can be whatever you want to be. Uh, when you... What he has done um, in football will be very difficult to ever replicate. Yeah. And I can't imagine it ever getting replicated. Uh, number one, the competitive stamina that he has is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Number two, he sits there and has put his team in position to win every year. He is an incredible listener. So when you talk about how he is as a head coach, I would say where he is a differentiator um, is his willingness to listen and his willingness to be able to compartmentalize what everybody's saying and then make a decision. Mm -hmm. um, he is, sure he's tough on coaches, I guess. I don't know what that means really because just do your job, you yeah. know, and do it well and then you're fine. Yeah. Um, you've got to be able to keep up with him. Mm -hmm. He's unique in his ability to work He's unique in his ability to have competitive stamina. And uh, what I would say, when you learn from him and when you work for him, you really understand that the game is about blocking and tackling. Yeah. <laughs> and when you make it more than that is when you actually confuse yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you could be an incredible fundamental teacher and recognize that strength and conditioning is a fundamental, mm -hmm. and you recognize that running to the ball is effort, yeah. But the fundamental goes, once you get to the ball, what yeah. are you going to do? Yeah. That's where he separates himself. Throughout your time in the league, Patriots, it, with, with Sean McVay and the Rams, how much of the NFL pro-style offenses have you taken here to college? Have you had to change some terminology type of things? You know, just talk me through the, kind of the, the correlation or how you translated it to the college game. Yeah, we're about 90% of our offense uh, – you would be able to see on Sunday, yeah. I would say. Maybe 10% of it is just based upon college hashes or unbalanced rules mm -hmm. of some nature that you just aren't allowed to yeah. run. Maybe 5%. Uh, we're, our, our system um, is one in which I've taken what I believe I'm most comfortable coaching from Mike Shanahan's um, run game, play action passing, and boot game to um, Sean's ability to marry the run and the pass and take those two core offenses, mm -hmm. which is really all from the same branch. We ran that in Seattle with Jeremy Bates, who came from Coach Shanahan as well. And you take that system right there and you say, how are we going to incorporate that with more shotgun offense? How are you going to incorporate that with a little more no huddle tempo? And how are you going to incorporate it with less words because of the fact that we don't have a communicator? Yeah. Other than that, I would hope that a pro team would turn on our offense and say, this is what it would look like on a Sunday. How, how do you, when someone asks what you do on offense, how do you describe it? Pro style? Is that what you say? I say it's a Sunday system. I say, because I don't know what pro style means anymore. Because <laughs> people would define pro style pro as like style under center up. eye right, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. which is not what we do. I mean, we're an 11 personnel every snap. Well, 90%. Mm -hmm. um, I say what you watch on Sunday, you will do here. Mm -hmm. And what you watch on Sunday, when you turn the Rams on, when you turn the Bengals on, when you turn the um, Seahawks on, that's really what you're going to be doing here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you could turn the Dolphins on or the 49ers on or the Jets on and teams that run the same system. You'll see 
parts of it. But if you really want to know what you're going to do and really want to know where you fit in, you know, it's the Vikings, it's the Rams, mm -hmm. it's the Seahawks, it's mm -hmm. the Bengals. We gotta get you showing some love to the twelve personnel man a little bit. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, you'll get that about ten percent of the time. <laughs> Just not enough, right? Um, the uh, throughout your career, you probably went on a bunch of different interviews. I'm curious to hear what the toughest or toughest job interview you went on during your career was. Well. You know, I, I interviewed for the Temple job, in two, the Temple head coaching job in 2015. And that was the first head coaching interview that I could think, that I had. And I was, I don't know, uh, 2015. So I was 38 years old. And um, I think the unique part of that is that I sat in a room with about 14 people. And it was just one big conference room with you know, around the horn, and you'd get all these different questions asked of all different topics. And I was just coming out of being in college football for one year. And it was like, how are you going to handle, you know, this situation? Or <laughs> what are your thought process on APR and GSR? And I was like, ooh, okay. So it was a good learning curve on the preparation of being interviewed uh -huh. that you have to be able to answer a question from a donor in chair number one, a academic advisor in chair number three, the provost at the end of the table, the vice president of athletics on the right, and be able to really get a great grasp and understanding of everything. Who were the 14 people? Just, just the search committee? It was a one member of a search firm, but it was in that room, you had the AD, the senior associate AD, the director of fundraising, you had a former coach of another sport, you had donors. I mean, it was, it was a lot. Um, and it was a really good experience because it made me spend the next, let's call it five years, six years, um, as I had different interviews throughout the way of preparing and yeah. finding different, uh, knowing that I had any answer, yeah. any question could be asked. So th there's a lot of conversation right now about conference realignment. And I, I have to ask you, and I know you got to give me the, the probably the, the, the typical answer, but um, a lot of talk right now about possible realignment within the Pac-12 and the Big 12. There's been reports out about Arizona. How do you feel about, number one, the state of the Pac-12 conference right now? No media rights deal yet, um, at least reportedly. And, you know, about the potential for Arizona or other schools to leave the Pac-12 and go to, uh, to go to possibly the Big 12. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, this is decisions that are, you know, based on revenue yeah. and based on multimedia rights. And they're not really um, based on football or well, they're all based on football, but they're not based on what we believe is, you know, what we need rather than it's what the university needs and how football drives all the revenue mm -hmm. um, to pay for the athletic departments. So conference realignment has become a major discussion point because as the NCAA has continued to allow or have less restriction, mm -hmm the cost to do business is more. <laughs> and as the cost to do business is more, multimedia rights deal is the only way to get the revenue up. Yeah. You know, we could go 12 and 0, and we still only have 51,000 people at the games, yeah. right? Because that's our maximum capacity. Mm -hmm. So where's your revenue coming from if it's not coming from multimedia rights? Yeah. So I think that's what we're all living through right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we recognize the fact that you know, the college football playoff system will bring another billion dollars in, but how are we going to revenue share that? And how is that going to work in your media rights deal? Yeah. Uh, so I think that we're in a spot that Arizona is going to have a place to go. Mm -hmm. And that's what I tell our recruits. <laughs> Be all right. That's what I tell our donors. <laughs> that's what I tell our families of, you know, current personnel. Mm -hmm. We have a great brand. And we have a great basketball program. We have a great softball program, a great baseball program. And I believe we have the opportunity to have an incredible football program yeah. we're fine yeah where we play our road games we'll wait and see for our president but um we are locked in and loaded for this season and um we're gonna try to just be where our feet are which is right now in the pack 10 yeah how involved are you know just curious from a head coach perspective while the ad and the president make those 
are having all those conversations? How involved is the head coach, not just here, but at other programs too? How, 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 how much of, of those conversations are you part of? You know, not much. Yeah. Not much. I mean, our president and our AD are phenomenal. I mean, our president is as involved in any athletic program in the country. He knows exactly what's happening. As we know, he was the one that put on the uh, summit in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., where one of the four panels was on realignment. Yeah. So it's a huge part that we all recognize and understand. But I would just say that in the end, you know, they're going to make a decision that's in the best interest of the athletic department at the University of Arizona. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to understand and know that that decision is going to be in the best interest of the yeah. University of Arizona and athletic department, which in turn will become the best yeah. interest for our football team. I feel like you've been very aggressive on social media with the branding publicly, even doing things like this, right? I mean, it's not easy to get coaches to sit down for an hour and talk about themselves and the program. Has that been intentional, you know, to kind of get the brand out there and use social media? You're active on Twitter. It's, you know, I feel like you've used a lot of that stuff. Am I right in saying that? And has that been yeah, yeah, intentional? It, it certainly is intentional um, because – you know, if we don't do it, who's going to do it? Who's going to yeah. help promote our players? Who's going to get our players out there? Who's going to encourage fans to be at all of the games? Um, you know, I, I just think we're past the time where you, you know, oh, if I see a picture on a bus stop of, you know, buy season tickets, I'm going to go buy season <laughs> yeah. tickets, right? They want to invest in the people. They want yeah. to invest in the person. Uh, for, for us, as we've said, like, one of my number – my number one pillar when I got here was to invest in the community mm -hmm. and be a part of the community. To do that, you got to share what's going on. That's why I have all my practices open in the spring. I have all my practices open in training camp. Uh, I want people to come out there. We do fan fest like you do in the NFL mm -hmm. where we have activities for kids and face painting and DJ and all while we're having practice. Um, we want it to be a place where people come. Mm -hmm. And if we just did the same old, same old, then I think we'd have the same results, which is the definition yeah. of insanity. So <laughs> we've had eight winning seasons here in 23 years. Mm -hmm. We've had only uh, three times where they've won more than eight games. So when that's the case, uh, we've got to do something different. Yeah. And uh, it was my belief that we needed to bring energy and enthusiasm uh, to, to the program. I've always thought having the closed practices 24-7 was, was a little overboard. Um, I love hearing that you're letting the media in yeah. for practice. Wait. Fans, fans. Yeah. We let fans yeah. in. Anyone that wants to come. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, you had a huge recruiting win in 2022. You've had a bunch, but a huge one was landing T-Mac, Kean Burnett, and Noah Fafita, is that mm -hmm. his last name, from Servite High School in, in California. Uh, that was, I feel like that was one of the first moments where even, you know, again, someone who was on the, I believe the East Coast at the time was like, okay, they're, they're doing things at a high level in Arizona. Landing, T-Mac was the main one, one of the best players in the country. What was that recruiting process like? And what was the moment in that where you were like, we may get all three of these guys? <laughs> yeah, well, it was, uh, I mean, it, we ended up getting Jacob Manu, too, as our linebacker yeah, right, from yeah. that same school who ended up, you that's know, right. became yeah. a yeah. freshman All-American. I forgot, he's a Servite guy, too. Servite right. also. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was one of those, well, we got Noah. Yeah. Noah was first. It was the key. <laughs> Noah was first, and we got Noah in March. Yeah. And then we had a June official visit where... We had T Mac, Kean, and mm -hmm. Noah. And uh, Kean was committed to SC mm -hmm. at the time, but his dad went to U of A. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> Join Noah. <laughs> and uh, come believe in us, you know, yeah. and be a part of this thing. And his parents were are, are awesome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he took a couple, he took a step back and thought about it and decided to become, he was number two. Mm -hmm. He was the number two domino that fell. Mm -hmm. Uh, then I went out and I watched them play a game, and they were all unbelievable. T-Mac mm -hmm. is sensational. Kean caught this back shoulder throw right in front of my face. I was like, oh, my God, this is unbelievable. <laughs> uh, and, but there was this kid, Jacob Manu, that made every tackle yeah. and caused fumbles. And so I got home that night. I called our defense coordinator. I said, why do we not have an offer on Jacob Manu? Never mind. We have an offer on Jacob Manu. So I offered Jacob <laughs> Manu that night, and uh, – 
<laughs> then he came on an official visit the next weekend, and he committed. Mm -hmm. So then we had three. Now there's peer pressure. Yeah. <laughs> but T was holding strong, man. He yeah. was holding strong. Uh, changes occurred. Became that he was thinking about his best friend in the world is Noah. Mm -hmm. So he was struggling mm -hmm. not being with Noah. And uh, signing day came, and he didn't sign. Didn't sign anywhere. And he said he needed 24, 48 more hours. And then I was in Cabo on that Friday morning, and <laughs> they FaceTimed me. And uh, I drew on the beach a big T Mac. Uh, I that, yeah. And it was, uh, it was about as cool as it gets, yeah. man. And, and he has lived up mm -hmm. to his reputation. Was that a stressful signing day? What, what, I guess they're all stressful, right? Well, it was but. stressful because it was our first signing day. Yeah. We had no other, you know, we only signed one player. Yeah. Um, the first class, everybody else, or two players, everybody else was signed. Signed, yeah. So, um, yeah, that first yeah. signing day was pretty stressful. And I saw Keenan Burnett in the weight room. He looks like a tight end now. I told him, I said, you actually look like you play tight end now. Yeah, <laughs> and he's only been, he was only been here one year. Yeah. So I think we're going to get him to a spot where uh, he looks pretty good right now. I think he'll continue to grow. Yeah, he looks good. Uh, we, we talked about your whole career and how you got to this point, but you actually didn't play football, right? Right. And we kind of skip. You talked about how you went to Florida. What was it? You said you went to Florida because you wanted to be to coach for Steve Spurrier. What made you decide you wanted to coach if you didn't play? Yeah. Well, I I grew up. Uh, my dad was a college tennis player, and I grew up playing tennis my whole life, and kind of thought that's what I was, you know, going to play some college tennis and then mm -hmm. probably go to law school and you know move on. <laughs> um, and then uh, my mom was. You know, my parents were divorced for years. My mom was dating a head football coach at Bergen Catholic High School. Um, he was at West Sussex High School, Bergen Catholic, Hackensack, one of the winningest coaches in the state of New Jersey. And he lived with us, and I'm like, I love this. This is amazing. You know, but you, you, you just don't start playing mm -hmm. late in the, in, the, in the game, you know what yeah. I'm saying? So I was playing tennis every day and decent at it, you know, and very competitive in that regard. So I was like, all right, well, I'll just learn how to coach then because <laughs> this game of football is the greatest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and, I mean, obviously I knew football, but yeah. it was a whole nother world when I just would spend every single night watching tape against a – you know, against our wall in our house with the black and white film running and then, <laughs> uh, you know, the little ch -ch 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 yeah. clicker thing. And that was it. And at that point in time, I fell in love with coaching. And I just um, determined that I was going to be uh, a football coach. As a, as a head coach now, one of the dynamics I'm super interested in is how, you know, by all accounts, you're a player's coach, right? Players love you. They like playing for you. How do you balance every single day being a player's coach and, and being a guy that they like and that they can come talk to, but also not being their friend, right? And making sure that there's, that you don't ever cross that, that, you know, that you have the respect constantly and you have to be demanding. Like, what's that balance like and how do you, how do you go about it every day? Yeah, it's a great balance. It's a great question. Um, I think uh, we run a hard program. Mm -hmm. So we're able to show love. Yeah. Um, we're very demanding. Uh, we had a, our team had a team GPA of over a 3.0 mm -hmm. as a 93 players. We had, you know, we've done 3,000 hours of community service since I've been here. So we require a lot of them. Mm -hmm. We have long practices. We tackle a lot. We're physical. Um, we don't let them get away with anything. So what they recognize is, yes, you can always come talk to me. And yes, the door is always open. And I, I really do have great affection for our players. I always say I have three daughters and 110 sons. But in the same regard, I think that there's a respect of this isn't going to be easy. Yeah. Even if, you know, coach can do it with a smile. <laughs> yeah. No, it makes sense. And that, yeah, it's just always the fine line. I'm, I'm curious. And they, uh, so you, you guys do tackle in practice. You're going full pads during this season and stuff. You're not doing the NFL mindset of, no. uh, you didn't carry that part over. No, you. I did not. <laughs> we're, we're not, you know, the biggest thing is we're not, we're, we're not um, NFL players. Yeah. We're trying to learn how to Develop, be an NFL player. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to develop them and teach them how to tackle. And yeah. I just believe the best way to teach someone how to tackle is tackle. Yeah. Um, no, we tackled. We tackle is what the maximum you're allowed to tackle. We're tackled. We tackle. <laughs> the maximum you're allowed to wear full pads, we wear full pads. Yeah. Um, we, we really don't 
Those are the things we haven't sacrificed, and I don't expect to sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, it's our goal to be a really good fundamental football team. Yeah. And to do that, I just have a hard time thinking that we're at the level right now where we can uh, go treat them like an NFL yeah. player. Last few things I got for you. I appreciate all your time. This has been this has been fun. What's the daily routine for you like? What's the daily routine of a of a head football coach? Oh boy, um, is my doctor listening to this right now? Because <laughs> if he is, I'm this, guessing you're an early riser. This won't go over well. <laughs> I'll start with that. Um, yeah, you know, I've actually changed my routine from year one to year three. Um, in the middle of year two, I kind of changed my routine. I was never seeing my wife, ever, ever, ever. I wasn't seeing my kids. Um, so I made a conscious decision that from 5.30 in the morning to 6.30 in the morning, I was going to have coffee with my wife. Mm -hmm. that, was the, the, that, that was my big conscious decision and then leave to go to work after that. Um, now, in season, I don't know if I'll be able to stay as disciplined <laughs> on that, but that is the big decision for me. Um, so we could spend some time together. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, uh, whatever happens in your day, is it changes on a daily. Um, I don't get home till very late. Uh, I do spend a lot of time up here because I run the offense. Mm. So, you know, you're trying to be the offensive coordinator. Yeah. You're trying to be as involved in the day-to-day -day as you were when you were only the offensive coordinator. Mm -hmm. And then make sure that the team is taken care of. So, yeah, the hours are long. Uh, I should exercise more. <laughs> I try to play tennis once or twice a week. I don't ever succeed on doing that, but at least once a week. Tennis, I play no, a little pickleball. I was going to say no pickleball, okay. Our head yeah. basketball coach is, you know, he's also the head pickleball coach. <laughs> um, so it's a very impressive, very impressive uh, resume he has. Mm -hmm. But he is a pickleball guru. Um, our tennis coaches play a lot of pickleball. So we do have a great head coaching circle there. That's cool. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, for the most part, it's a lot of football. What's the relationship? This is a, I thought of this on the, on the car ride here. What's the relationship between hard work, luck, and talent and be getting to the point that you've gotten right now and also the point that, you know, some of the great athletes you've coached have gotten to? Hard work, luck, and talent. Um, well, you know, I think that it starts with talent. It starts with talent. Gotta have it. <laughs> if you don't have talent, then none of it matters. Yeah. Okay, so start, start there. I don't know how much of the cup you would fill that says talent, but without it, there's zero chance. <laughs> um, then, after that, it's the guys that work hard with talent become the real players, the guys that don't work hard with talent become lost and forgotten. Mm -hmm. And then luck is what allows you to be successful in life mm -hmm. uh, once you have the talent and the hard work. Yeah. Because, as we all know, I mean, guys get drafted to bad situations and they never make it. Mm -hmm. You know, guys get um, put in bad spots and they never make it. You know, there's, there's a very short leash on what we're able to do and capable of doing in a very short amount of time to get it done. So what you do and what you take over and how it looks and offensively and defensively and skill-wise as a player and coach or whatnot, I think it's all of it. Yeah. I think it's all of it. I would say talent starts it. Yeah. Hard work gets you where you really want to be, and then luck probably gets you paid. It gets you over the edge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to play a quick little game. I want to name some. I want to name some people that have been part of your career. I want you to give me the first word that comes to mind when I say them. Okay, Is that fair? Yeah. Bill Belichick. Toughness. Cam Newton. Amazing. <laughs> Sean McVay. Elite. Jim Harbaugh. Unique. That's what I was guessing. That was going to be the word for him. Pete Carroll. Energizer Bunny. Howie Roseman. Determined. Steve Spurrier. Swagger. And then the last one as a, as a gift to my buddy, Jake Butt. Great announcer. <laughs> nah, I get it. Great player. <laughs> he is a good announcer. He's killing it. Big Ten Network. Great player. Yeah, he's awesome. Um, best piece of advice you've ever received? Be you. Be you. Don't. 
My dad once said, you know, it's better to try and fail than fail to try and suffer the inestimable loss of what might have been. And I think when it's all said and done, you know, be the person you want to be and give it your best shot. Last thing I got for you, I end every interview with this question. What's your why? What's the reason that, that you do what you do, that you work the long hours, that you, that you grind every day? I love it, number one. And number two, I love seeing kids that weren't as fortunate as me become successful. Yeah, I love it. Well, great. Coach, I appreciate your time. Anything I missed? Anything else I, we got nah, to hit on? It's awesome. I Thank appreciate you. all the time. I, think, you know, this is, we, I went a little over my, my allotted time. It's okay. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's, it's been fun watching you build this place. I'm excited to see where you take it and hopefully win some championships. Yeah. Thank appreciate you. Coach. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks. It wasn't too bad, right? Uh, Easy? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was great. I appreciate it, man. That was yeah. fun. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks for doing this. I want to tell you guys about a new sponsor of the podcast, Athletic Greens. And when I found out Athletic Greens was sponsoring the pod, I was fired up because it's something I actually use. Guys, I've been super picky about who actually sponsors this podcast because I don't want to be promoting things I don't like. And that's why I wanted to do Athletic Greens. I use it every single day. Athletic Greens is super easy to use. It's one scoop and you get tons, 70 plus vitamins, minerals, nutrients, a bunch of other stuff that I know is good for you. I don't even know what it is though. And it's delicious, tastes good, it makes me feeling great. With my busy travel schedule, it's super hard to make sure I'm getting my nutrients, get my vitamins, and Athletic Greens makes it super easy. Now that I'm getting farther away from my playing career, I've been taking my health more and more seriously, been talking to my doctor about it, and Athletic Greens has been a major part of feeling more energized, getting back in better shape, and even improving my digestive system. So whether you're a current athlete, former athlete, or just a regular person trying to optimize your health and optimize performance, I encourage you to invest in your health today with Athletic Greens and AG1 and see the massive difference it can make in your everyday energy. If you want to take ownership of your health, try AG1 today and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel pack with your first purchase by going to drinkag1.com slash next up. That's drinkag1.com slash next up and get a one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs. And guys, please support the sponsors of this podcast like AG1 because your support for them supports me, supports us, and allows us to create this great content. So go to drinkag1.com slash next up and support our podcast and take advantage of your health with athletic greens let me tell you guys about my favorite way to make money on sports and fire on sports it's prize picks prize picks is sponsoring this pod and i love it because i actually use it all the time i've been trying different sports books different daily fantasy apps and prize picks is by far the best prize picks is different than regular sports books or sports betting because on prize picks you're picking players not teams so if you know sports no ball know what players are going to ball out you can make tons of money on prize picks each player has a set projected total for a stat let's say points rebounds if it's Steph Curry, 30 points, you pick higher or lower for Steph Curry. Super fun, and you can make tons of money. I've been ripping on it, and I have a special promo code for you guys to get a $100 deposit bonus with the code NEXTUP. Use the code NEXTUP when you download prize picks, or click the link in the description, and it'll do it automatically for you. Code NEXTUP gets you a $100 deposit bonus so you can fire on sports on prize picks. Let's rock on prize picks. If you haven't heard already, it is smooth sack summer. That's right, this is the summer you keep your balls cool while still looking hot with Manscaped. Manscaped's the leader in below the waist grooming and they all want us to have a ball this summer. Dive headfirst into smooth sack summer by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with my code Adam B. Quick story for you guys about Manscaped. So last summer, before I was a Manscaped user, I was grooming myself before I went to the beach. And let's just say I had a little accident and nicked my balls the wrong way, I had a little bit of a cut. Now normally I'm a big beach guy and dive right into the ocean. Now normally I'm a big ocean guy, but this time I went head first into the salt water and let's just say that grooming issue down below came back to haunt me in the worst possible way. That was when I went looking for a solution for my grooming, the family jewels, and I found Manscaped and I've used it almost every single day. Well, not quite every day every other day since. So trust me, you're hearing it from me, a guy with experience, you need Manscaped to trim your family jewels because it is officially smooth sack summer. Go to manscaped.com, use my code ADAMB for 20% off and free shipping on your next order. And please guys, support the sponsors of this podcast because it helps me, allows us to travel around and have one amazing guest. So support Manscaped for sponsoring this pod. Go to manscaped.com, use the code ADAMB for 20% off and free shipping on your next order.